uh, with this talk, um, uh, I want to share some um, uh, development that we've done uh, on bractography uh, recently. Um, uh, so some of the work actually um, was done during my um, my postdoc with uh, Virginia Shamat, and uh, some of the work are uh, uh, basically ongoing work uh, and at my um, uh, current uh, current bin line i thirteen dash one diamond light source. So firstly, I want to uh, briefly uh, review bractography. Then I want to talk about the the challenges uh, we are facing. Uh, and the development uh, we've done trying to cope with those challenges. Uh, in the end, I want to share some, uh, some Brax CDR and Tarkovsky work uh, uh, I'm currently working on uh, at I-13-1. So um, I assume the, the majority of the audience here uh, knows quite well the, the CDI or Brax CDI, this technique. So I won't spend uh, too much time here. So the, the general idea here is um, you have an extended bin, then, you, um, then your, your crystal is small uh, compared to your bin. Um, you place your detector at one, uh, one of the bracket peaks um, uh, from this crystal, then you rotate your crystal to collect um, a stack of 2D cuts of the of the uh, uh, 3D receptacle space. So this gives you um, um, uh, like uh, the intensity of the, of the um, uh, intensity di uh, distribution around that uh, particular black peak. And you need to uh, use phase retrieval algorithm to, to get back to the real space, which would give you a, a complex electron density um, um, quantity and this uh, with the modulus part uh, encodes the electron density of the crystal, which give you the morphology information, and the 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 phase uh, information encodes the uh, lattice uh, displacement field uh, from where you can extract the strain information. So Bragg tagography, you can simply uh, think of it as a um, as a scanning version of Bragg uh, CDI. Um, so instead of uh, so in addition to uh, to the rotation scan, you you have to introduce a, a, a positional uh, scan as well, and you have to make sure your uh, your illumination uh, um, at the two neighboring uh, positions uh, have to be partially overlapped, and this introduce some uh, redundancy in your data, which would help um, to give you uh, much more robust reconstructions. And because of the um, uh, scanning, so you can look at much larger crystal. Uh, uh, instead of uh, small crystals, you can look at Brax, uh, with Brax CDR. So the uh, reconstruction would, the phase retrieval part would be very similar to, to the transmission tachography. Um, so you have to loop through different uh, positions and propagate back and forth uh, between real and detected plane to, to apply the constraints there. Um, uh, but the only difference here is uh, with Bragg tachography, uh, the quantities are, are 3D, and in transmission tachography, uh, they are 2D. So here's a, a rough timeline that how uh, Bragg tachography progressed. Um, so uh, its first uh, X ray experiment was done uh, in 2011. Um, um, it's basically a proof conceptually uh, uh, demonstrated it's working. And actually, later on, people are uh, trying to use this 2D uh, simplification to, um, to uh, study some uh, same films. Um, in this case, you don't need to do the rotational scan. Uh, you, have to, uh, you only need to sit at the Bragg angle and to, to do the positional scan. So the experiment is uh, much more uh, simpler. Um, and also, the reconstruction you can basically directly adapt from Transmission Tycho, it gives you a uh, very good reconstruction as well. But of course, your your uh, you are limited to uh, to two D uh, thin films. So you can't look at uh, three uh, look at three uh, three D samples. So um, uh, later on, actually, people find find out with the three D Bragg tachography, um, uh, it's actually better to um, to not reconstruct the the probe. 
So you normally uh, pre-characterize your probe and fix it. And that helps to, um, to give you better uh, object reconstruction. Then later on, you basically add more constraint to, to, your, reconstru uh, to your reconstructions. You know your sample has certain uh, thickness, so you apply this constraint. It's very similar to the spore constraint in, in Black CDR. So basically, as the reconstruction techniques improves and also the, uh, the bin line tactic, uh, techniques improves, so um, uh, slowly you can uh, you can uh, acquire a much more successful data set and Bragg Tackle slowly becomes a practical tool you can really use to, to, to tackle uh, real issues. So more applications start to appear. But despite um, all this success, um, Bragg Tackle still remains very challenging. Um, it needs a lot of ex uh, expertise, efforts, um, and sometimes the luck is also very important um, to get a decent data set. So one of the challenges uh, I found uh, very difficult is, um, is the inclined um, uh, 3D geometry. So all the um, quantities here involved are 3D and they have their own natural orthogonal frames like the probe object and detector. They have their own natural uh, 3D frames need to convert them between different uh, 3D frames. Um, and also uh, the most important thing is to, to assemble, uh, assemble on the data in a correct way. Um, what I mean by that is, um, um, so the detector frame you get uh, from the experiment, you might need to uh, flip left and right or up, uh, up and down, or even uh, uh, transpose. You need to get this um, correct in your defined frames uh, in order to to proceed with the reconstruction. And also the 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 two D translation, um, tachography, the translation has to be decomposed uh, in this uh, reconstruction frame correctly, and the sign of the uh, the sign of the motors has to be uh, uh, aligned with the frame you define uh, correctly as well. So even uh, this work is quite complicated and, and I still make a lot of uh, mistakes uh, when doing this. Um, so another challenge is um, you cannot really um, use 2D uh, uh, simplification for 3D case. Um, um, as um, in transmission uh, typography, you, uh, you actually can combine with tomography. In that case, um, you actually can deal with each uh, each angle independently as a two D case, but uh, with Bragg tachography, um, you cannot do, uh, do, uh, deal with it in that way. So angles has to be uh, uh, um, reconstructed uh, simultaneous, uh, simultaneously, and in this case, um, uh, your um, stability has to be maintained through the whole experiment. Uh, not uh, as in the transmission type tomography, uh, stability uh, only need to be maintained on projection level. So uh, it makes the experiment much, uh, or the requirement much, uh, much higher. Um, and the, uh, the 3D uh, probe reconstruction uh, is not uh, converging. That's uh, also limiting your, uh, your uh, uh, object reconstruction quality. So uh, another challenge factor is the um, is the limited photons that you can you can get in Bragg geometry compared to to transmission geometry. Often it's a one order or two orders or magnitude less. So this means you we when we do Bragg type work, we have to work at focal plane to gain the flux density. Um, but the problem is at focal plane your your probe are, are very small. And with Tagov scan, you need to require overlapping. So your step size is, uh, has to be uh, smaller as well. Um, so uh, your uh, stability requirement has to be better than your, uh, your step size. So your stability requirement is uh, uh, much higher as well in this case. And because the photon is, uh, is less, you need to expose, uh, expose longer to get decent uh, signal to noise ratio. So 
uh, and it involves rotation and translation. So the whole data uh, acquisition really takes very long. Uh, we typically design experiment to be uh, around 10 hours. Uh, longer than this um, would become very uh, in, um, impractical uh, for an experiment. Um, and during these 10 hours, and you need to make sure your, uh, your being is very stable. So I've already discussed the challenges. Uh, now I want to share the uh, developments we've done to cope with these uh, uh, issues. Um, I want to demonstrate those developments with these two works. Um, they actually published quite uh, recent, recently, um, and uh, also uploaded the, the code and data for both of these works. So if you feel interested, um, uh, you can try to get a copy and play with it. Um, so the first work is actually um, a, a collaboration with, uh, with uh, Felix Hoffman from uh, University uh, of Oxford. So he's trying to, um, to use a uh, helium ion implantation to a uh, tungsten to mimic the, the uh, neutron uh, uh, irradiation uh, um, uh, effect in, uh, in, in the fusion reactor at the protection layer and see how how it affects the mechanical property of tungsten. So he basically prepared this sample um, and we did this uh, experiment at ID1 uh, and we, ch uh, we chose an area that covers uh, a bit of the implantation uh, area and the non-implantation area and um, uh, close to a grain boundary. So we did this um, um, tackle scan on this area. Um, the first, uh, the first problem we, we faced is basically um, how do we do the um, probe reconstruction. Um, so the, the bypass is to um, first to um, uh, characterize the probe using the transmission geometry. Um, and you fix this probe um, um, in the Bragg toggle for reconstruction. And that's our characterized probe. And that's the uh, uh, Bragg toggle for object reconstruction. So the grain boundary here is a good indication um, uh, that this reconstruction is basically successful. Um, but um, you can see all these uh, uh, features that uh, it's not quite true. Um, so we think uh, we should uh, uh, consider to reconstruct the probe to improve this. And in, in X-rays, um, uh, because the focusing optics have much uh, small uh, numerical aperture, um, uh, this means you uh, the depth of focus is much longer. In this particular case, we propagate um, gave the probe through a few hundreds of microns, and you don't really see uh, big changes. And if you compare uh, with um, with the lens that uh, the beam intersect with the object, it's much longer. So it's safe to say your probe doesn't really change uh, along the propagation direction in this case. So we can basically uh, use this constraint to, to constrain our reconstruction. And indeed, uh, it, uh, um, it um, helps uh, with the convergency. We managed to do the probe reconstruction in this case. Um, and you can see the object reconstruction, it's, uh, it becomes smoother, but it still has a lot of uh, uh, these high frequency uh, features. Um, but if you compare this probe reconstruction with the character, uh, characterized probe, you can see actually you have a lot of bin tails outside the, uh, the reconstruction window. And we think this um, uh, affects the reconstruction quality. And this, uh, this window size is actually uh, limited by the um, angular stack size. Um, we used in the in the experiments. Actually, um, to to get a smaller uh, angular step size, we borrowed this um, uh, idea that uh, in transmission tycho you often have some uh, pixel that's um, pixel gap on your on your detector. Uh, you can you can use algorithm to retrieve those uh, gaps. And it's basically a similar idea. We can we can virtually uh, put some um, uh, angular point uh, in between the measured ones and use algorithm trying to recover those uh, uh, points. 
And these beds uh, effectively give you a smaller angular step size and uh, in return give you a, a larger uh, a reconstruction window size. And indeed, uh, probe, um, uh, you can reconstruct a much larger area of the probe. And in return, that gives you a larger field of view on the object as well. And then you start to see some small features that you couldn't see uh, before, um, uh, basically some uh, dis uh, dislocations. And of course, the uh, reconstruction quality is much better. And this part of the uh, illumination we couldn't see is because uh, the green boundary. Um, so this part of information is not really measured uh, on your black peak. So yeah, with this uh, reconstruction with the phase, you can extract the lattice property. Here is the strain. Um, and we can see the depth uh, uh, from the top. Um, it's about 2.6 microns, which uh, uh, matches quite well with the uh, uh, expectation and also the strain value, um, given how we prepared the sample. Um, what's nicely here is you can see this uh, little strain uh, enhancement as a, as a top and bottom surface uh, of this slab. Uh, and this is actually caused by the, by the fifth damage um, during the sample preparation. And what's nice here is um, you can, when you analyze the, the, the strain caused by the healing, you can exclu uh, exclude those two, uh, two um, um, layers. Um, caused by the FIB, uh, uh, FIB uh, which uh, this is not, it's not possible with other techniques like, um, like my, uh, actual microlaoe uh, or uh, electron EBSD, uh, this sort of techniques. And you can also extract the lattice uh, rotation, uh, which is quite smooth, indicates the, um, the, the distortion co caused by uh, helium is quite, um, uh, the direction is quite random. It doesn't have a preferential direction here. And you can also zoom in the, to those uh, dislocations and see, see its morphology and the, the phase distribution around it. So the second work is uh, was done uh, at Nanomax. So uh, thanks to Dino, we got this uh, commissioning bin time uh, at Nanomax. Um, uh, the good thing, uh, there is uh, the the current flux is very good. Uh, it's about ten to the ten at twelve kV, and we designed this um, uh, crystalline uh, silicon star uh, structure um, as a test pattern to 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 test the performance of bracketography and also the um, the the beam line. So with this good uh, coherence, we we managed to to use a very short exposure time in this case, 33 microns, uh, my, no, 33 milliseconds um, um, per frame. Uh, and that get, gives us decent uh, signal to noise um, ratio. Um, and with this short exposure, you, you can uh, basically uh, use fly scan with it. And that's what we did. So in the end, uh, a complete 3D data set uh, 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 the total exposure time is about 27 minutes, uh, but uh, actually the, 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 the experiment itself it takes, um, I think, slightly less than two hours because um, uh, some overheads. Um, and um, um, uh, as, uh, what we were told is the scanning stage at that time wasn't quite uh, optimized, uh, which uh, causing quite a lot of uh, overhead and also caused a lot of uh, issues for us here. It's basically the, uh, you can see the star um, under different angles, it, uh, it wobbles uh, around. Um, so, so this, um, this causing um, um, uh, basically a very bad reconstruction quality. Uh, if you take the data as, uh, as what it is, and that's the sort of quality you can, you can get. Um, but of course, one easy thing we can try here is because we scan a um, slightly larger area uh, uh, compared to this uh, star structure. We can, we can use cross correlation to, to roughly uh, align those patterns um, and reshuffle the data, basically. Um, you can see the star stays uh, uh, in one position uh, much better than before. 
and with this already you can you can uh, have a much better reconstruct quality uh, but the thing is um this cross correlation only gives you a, a rough uh, alignment so you still have a lot of residual uh, position errors um, and you can see those uh, effect uh, uh, left in your reconstruction um, and the problem is with the with the conventional reconstructing technology what we call a 3D for transform method 3DFT, which I will uh, introduce a little bit more later. And with this method, you cannot uh, basically uh, improve further. Um, so in, in 2017, uh, Stefan Hutzwitz from APS, um, together with uh, Virginia Shalmart, um, they developed this uh, new reconstruct te uh, technique called 3D Black Projection Targography. Um, uh, basically uh, allows um, um, uh, enables the possibility to 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 improve the this type of uh, uh, data uh, the recurrent quality further um, the reason the the conventional extraction um, 3dft uh, couldn't uh, improve further is um, when we take the data is um, we look through the uh, angles and on each angle we repeat um, um, the tachography scan, the positional scan, um, but then then you need to uh, um, to assemble all the angular slices for a particular uh, position into a three D three D diffraction pattern, um, and when you do this, you have to uh, it basically requires um, uh, this position under all these angles has to be exactly the same. Uh, uh, but uh, practically, uh, this uh, will never be true. Uh, and that's why uh, 3D for uh, will never be able to improve further here. But with the 3D BPP, uh, what it does actually is um, using the Fourier, Fourier slice theorem to decompose this uh, 3D diffraction, uh, well, the 3D Fourier transform um, into a series of uh, 2D Fourier transform. Uh, basically, you take um, you take uh, under uh, one particular angle, you take one one of these uh, slides. Then you look through all the positions to do the to do the reconstruction. Then you, then you repeat all this uh, for all the angles. And the benefit uh, benefit of it here is um, uh, the the positions under different angles can be completely different, and this basically allows the possibility of doing. Uh, uh, position correction because um, uh, position correction inevitably uh, create difference between uh, uh, between different angles, and it actually also allows um, to do the angular correction if this is necessary. So that's what we did. We, we coded the, the the algorithm and we tried it again, and that's the reconstruction quality we can uh, we can achieve. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's very obviously much much better, uh, and you can uh, basically in the reconstructing trying to recover the 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 global drift between angles and also the the individual position uh, errors uh, on each angle. If if you plot how the electron density, you actually can see uh, these uh, little uh, features that you can see from this SEM figure, um, uh, which is. Uh, is a which is quite surpri uh, surprised me. Um, um, uh, how do I say? Um, we we kind of amazed by by when we looked uh, these uh, small features. We didn't expect a black tackle. We can can see um, uh, see these small features. So we get a decent resolution and field of view on this data set. And with the phase, uh, phase result, you can extract the lattice property as well. Um, since we use fly scan, so it it, uh, it effectively blurs your your diffraction pattern, and that's equivalent to partial current effect. So we here also use the, the mode reconstruction uh, for this data set. You can see the mode uh, distribution it matches quite well with um, with the uh, forward. Uh, forward uh, a transmission geometry uh, and the mode structure. Um, we also actually tried the energy scan here. So energy scan 
basically uh, gives you an alternative uh, alternative way to uh, to um, to assess your three D uh, reciprocal space. So with the rotation, you basically um, uh, translate your detector uh, perpendicular to the to the scattering uh, scattering vector. But with the with the energy scan, you translate your detector plane along the scattering vector. Uh, but it also gives you uh, a stack of the three D um, uh, a diffraction pattern. But the benefit here is that you remove the rotation on the sample. Uh, it helps to improve the stability, of course. Um, if your sample needs to be in a complex environment, the, this would be uh, very bad, uh, beneficial. Um, we, we that, well, that's basically the, the result we got. Um, um, it's actually, you can see here, it has a bit of a distortion, which which uh, we couldn't manage to get rid of. Uh, um, uh, I think it's uh, it's um, most likely the the scanning stage uh, are doing some uh, weird thing that we don't we don't know. Um, but at least this uh, recurring result shows the uh, promising of this um, um, uh, energy scan. Uh, hopefully, we can repeat this experiment um, uh, at another time. Um, so in in the last section, I will. Uh, I will talk about some um, ongoing ongoing work that I'm I'm working on uh, I searching uh, dash one. So I searching is actually um um is um is a uh, uh, two branch line two independent branch line. So the, uh, one is called imaging branch, another is called coherence. So imaging branch basically do uh, directly imaging technique like in uh, inline phase contrast or, or transmission accurate microscopy. Uh, the current branch is uh, basically mainly do the current diffraction imaging techniques, uh, but uh, mostly tachography related techniques. So here are some general uh, specifications about the coherent branch. Uh, uh, the mono we use uh, um, a QCM, so it's basically for uh, silicon 111 uh, crystals, but mostly we use uh, just two of them, um, to um, uh, which is enough for the for the for the coherence um, for the co uh, coherent uh, requirement. And we also have another set of um, silicon 3, 311 uh, crystals. Um, basically, we have a lot a lot of space to to tune the 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 uh, the energy um, bandwidth. Uh, so the typical energy range is 7 to uh, 24 kVs. And source to sample distance is um, to 220 meters. And that gives um, a very large uh, spatial coherence lens uh, as a sample plane is about 400 microns. So we, uh, for the focusing optics, we mainly use a finesse zone plate, uh, um, which give us 200, micro, uh, 200 nanometers uh, spore size. Uh, we also have a KB, bendable KB. Um, uh, it gives uh, like five micron spore size. Um, um, I, I never used it and I was told um, uh, stability was uh, quite an issue, so it hasn't been used for quite long. Um, but I think this spore size is quite good for Black CDI, so I would like to give it a try, but I don't know how difficult to, to bring it back though. We also have um, 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 a different set of the CILs as uh, upstream of the of the beam line, which we can use to uh, either collimate the beam or or to form a secondary source, uh, which also give us some flexibility to to uh, to tune the focus size combined with finesse zone play, which we want to we want to try to see whether we can get a larger, slightly larger focus force to to do the Bragg CDI. So the techniques here we mainly do is basically both transmission and Bragg geometry, uh, and transmission is mainly um, uh, uh, tachography uh, combined with uh, different uh, techniques, and mainly here is the tomography. So it gives you um, a high resolution three D volume uh, image of your sample, and we also have um, two rope arm holes and vacuum pipe and another detector to do Bragg geometry. Um, basically, we can do both Bragg CDI and Bragg tachography. Um, so the Bragg geometry here, um, the the detector can 
can move to in this um, quadrant space uh, horizontally up to 30 degrees and vertically 29 degrees. Um, and um, the robot the, the vacuum pipe is about is about two two point six meters, and uh, and the detector we typically use here is um it's a diamond in house uh, detector called Excalibur um RX three M, uh it's basically use a Medipix uh, Medipix uh, chip uh three by eight um, um so yeah those are the 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 specifications. Um, so the sample um, uh, stage has three rotation stage. So uh, the rotation uh, along the um, along the vertical uh, axis is um, can rotate more than 180 degrees because we need to use it as for the tomography case as well. And, and the other two rotation stage um, uh, goes to um, from plus minus 15 degrees. Um, so I also take this uh, silicon star sample and uh, did one uh, did uh, bractography on, um, on our beam line. Uh, uh, of course, our flux is much uh, much less compared to nanomax, uh, so we have to use a much longer exposure time here. But our focus spot is uh, is larger, so we can use much less uh, positions to to cover the same uh, area here. So in the end, the the whole experiment uh, takes about four hours, and this includes um, the the overhead. This is basically um, uh, the whole experiment uh, it takes. Um, and the I think this lens is basically um, it's not too bad for a third generation source, given especially given the 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 uh, recurrent quality you get uh, on the object. And also here, actually, um, deliberately um, uh, opened up um, the front end slits to to get a bit more flux, but sacrifice a bit on the coherence. And you can see uh, the mode structures uh, mostly horizontally. That's basically the slits I opened, uh, and um, uh, Brock Tarkovsky did quite a good job to get these mode structures out. Um, I also tried uh, nanocrystals uh, with both Black CDI and Black Tychography. Um, um, the idea is basically want to uh, the the ultimate goal for me here is to want to show that Black Tychography can can reconstruct uh, much, uh, reconstruct much highly uh, strained crystals. Uh, but it's also very interesting to see um, um, the Black CDI here because. Um, uh, our spore size is uh, it's uh, quite small. It's uh, smaller than the uh, particle, so we have to uh, defocus uh, uh, our beam to to do black CDI. And when you when you defocus, you have this phase curvature effect. So it's also interesting to see this uh, defocus um, uh, uh, effect uh, on black CDI. So um, yeah, basically black. Bracktography has this benefit that it can deconvolve out the probe profile. In in this case, um, uh, so you won't have this uh, uh, this phase curvature effect uh, on your crystal. Uh, and uh, and another could be beneficial is um, is you don't have this twin image uh, uh, ambiguity as you you have in Bracksidi on. So here are some. Basically, the the parameter used for the for for the data collection, um, and the three different crystals. I actually done more, but I only show three here. Um, so the the first one is you you use fib to cut a small hole in the in the uh, in the crystal, and the second one is the uh, intact um, uh, uh, crystal. So we've done nothing to it. And and third one is um uh, it's a non uh, indented uh, crystal. Um, and then we can see a little bit more detailed comparison. So the first one, um, if we take the the cut through the three orthogonal uh, central planes, you can see the phase actually broadly matches with each other, but you definitely see differences. And if you align them and take a phase difference, uh, you can see that's the difference you get. And um, uh, at the beginning, I would thought, okay, the phase difference would be uh, 
uh, just the phase curve to get from your probe. And here to to be noted the the to be noted is the, is the scale here. Uh, so the crystal is only like one micron. So if you compare with the probe here, it's only the pretty much the the central blue area. Uh, uh, it's actually quite uh, broadly flat, I would say. It has a small uh, curvature there. Um, in ideal case, um, I would thought the phase difference is just um, it's, it's just the phase curvature you got from the probe, but uh, but it's not the case here. And the reason I think later on it's um, it's um, when we do the uh, Bragg's CGI moment, we typically repeat um, a few uh, rocking curves to increase the dy uh, dynamic range. Um, but the thing is when you, uh, each time of this uh, rocking curve moment, your crystal might be slightly uh, moved with respect to the beam. So this can cause an average effect. So you don't necessarily see uh, the, the phase difference, it's just the, the, uh, the curvature from your probe. But it's still, it's still confusing to me that this, uh, why the phase difference is like this. Um, so in this second case, it's, um, it's an intact um, crystal. Um, actually, um, to me, um, this comparison, uh, Bragg Taco seems more reasonable because, um, because the uh, face is quite flat. Um, uh, that means your, your crystal doesn't really have a lot of strain inside it. But somehow the Bragg CDI gives um, uh, gives uh, basically shows some strain in, in the crystal. And if if you do a phase uh, difference between these two, and you compare with the probe file, it's actually um, it actually matches uh, slightly. Uh, if you uh, if you if you see this uh, slightly, uh, well, if you. I don't, I don't know how to describe the colors here in English, sorry. But I mean, it's uh, basically, um, if you compare with this, it's, it matches basically, this, this slice and this slice particularly. Uh, and this slice, is, this, it's, it's not quite there. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's basically, um, uh, I personally think, personally think it's quite interesting. Uh, comparison here. Um, and the last one uh, with the nano identity crystal, it becomes very uh, interesting and, and confusing to me. Um, um, because look at, uh, look at the face, uh, um, because I would thought Braxidia actually shows, um, um, I would expect with the nano identity the crystal have this uh, sort of phase profile in your reconstruction. But Braxidia somehow shows um, a quite confusing uh, um, uh, uh, phase uh, reconstruction here. Um, but actually, if you look at the uh, modulus part, um, Brax CDI showed this um, uh, uh, oscillations uh, uh, in the modulus, which I don't quite think that's uh, uh, that's real. And, and it's also why this part of the uh, crystal is missing. Um, so yeah, it's still very um, confusing and, and the result is quite new to me. I need to spend a bit more time to, to, um, to dig into it. Um, but I want to show here and so the audience can give some uh, opinions, suggestions uh, to, to create a, a, a good discussion about them. So to summarize, um, we uh, we basically implemented the probe reconstruction uh, with uh, this propagation invariance constraint, and that helps to improve the object rec uh, reconstruction quality. And with the long data co uh, collection issue, um, we can use angular upsampling to to mitigate that. And also with fourth generation synchrotron source, we can afford to use a default spin, which means your probe can be larger to cover the same area. You 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 need to use much, uh, much less positions. And also with fourth generation synchrotrons, you can use flight scans. Um, and with the stability issue, um, uh, 
uh, with this new uh, recurrent technique called 3DBVP, you basically can incorporate position uh, correction algorithms, uh, which helps to relax the, uh, the stability. And um, with the with the Braxidia and Tychography work, I'm currently working on uh, I-31. Uh, I hope I convinced you that Brax Tychography works quite well on I-13-1. Um, but um, but the comparison between these two on the nanocrystals, um, um, I'm not sure the defaults being um, how much it affects the result and and how it affects the result. I think here uh, what I need uh, is um, is to have uh, one of these crystals uh, to use a larger focus beam to um, to to do the plan uh, plan with uh, Braxidia on to 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 have another reference here. Um, uh, in principle, of uh, tachography um, is good for high, uh, uh, for highly deformed crystals, which which will be struggling for Brax CDI, and that's what I hope I can demonstrate. Uh, probably the examples I showed here is not very convincing. Um, so basically, yeah, I need to probably find a better crystal or do more uh, do more uh, experiment on 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 these uh, crystals. Um, and with this, yeah, um, I would like to thank all the all the collaborators and colleagues that uh, involved and helped with uh, with the work I show here. Uh, and also, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Pang, for this overview. Uh, I would say it's almost a tutorial, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really uh, clear and interesting. And now the uh, floor is open for comments, questions. Please don't be shy. Uh, you can open your cameras and mute yourself. Or if you like, you can just write a question in the chat and I will read it to you. Tillman. Uh, I think you should unmute yourself, I'm, I'm afraid. Yes, unmuting even helps uh, get making my point. Uh, that was a really nice talk, Pank. Thank you for this. Um, I was wondering, do you, I mean, I was, the, the BRAC CDI versus BRAC Tycho comparison was super interesting to me. Do you have ideas how to get with like a third method um, the ground truth or ideas for designing a sample which has such a controlled strain distribution that mm. you know what you're getting. Yeah, that's what I mean towards the conclusion I said, um, towards the summary I said, um, um, we need to do a plane wave Brax CDI on it, which we need a larger focus beam uh, to create this plane wave condition. Um, Hopes that gives you it gives the ground truth um, cons uh, ground truth uh, comparison basically. But how do you know if that is ground truth? <laughs> anyway, well, I mean, apart that... from this, um, only simulation, I guess, can can give you the answer to it. Experimentally, I guess you always have the doubt. I um, mean, which one is really the ground truth? Virginie, you're second in line. And you should also mute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Same. I've lost the mouse. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi, Peng. I'm super happy to see these uh, results. Uh, I remember during your last talk, you were giving a little uh, teaser about, uh, yeah. about this uh, promising uh, experiment and uh, it's really cool to see that uh, you have managed to, to progress quite a lot. Um, I was wondering about the curvature. So I didn't really get uh, where is the curvature in which of the samples. So the difference between the two presents yeah. a curvature, right? A phase curvature. So it could it could either be that the curvature is in the Bragg CDI data set or in the typography data set, right? But but the thing is with Bragg typography, you no, but so it, it could be right. 
for imperial black tower decomposed the probe out, right? Because really? I don't know if you remember when Arthur was doing inversion, but he was always retrieving a sample with a curvature and the opposite curvature in the probe. You don't don't you remember this? Yes, but uh, it won't be the case here because because um, uh, your well in this case actually my crystal is um it's a small uh small quantity and my bin is the extended quantity. So I basically use my crystal as a probe to scan my bin um, in this case. But the thing is you cannot have an opposite phase curvature on a small quantity and have another opposite on your extended quantity. It, they won't cancel out. Okay. If you understand what I mean. I think I understand what you mean, but uh, it's uh, counterintuitive with what I remember from uh, Arthur uh, reconstruction and uh, experiments. Yeah, it won't I don't out. see why uh, the comparison is not uh, valid. Um, but um, one of the possibility I explain is because when we do Black CDI, we repeat uh, a few rocking curves and sum them together to give you more signal. To no, no, no but I, I, I understand you found an explanation to explain yeah. the curvature in the Black CDI data set, but I was wondering whether the curvature could not be in the Bragg tachography data set instead. And and then I I, I, I don't understand why you are ruling this uh, out uh, 100%, but okay. Okay, it's maybe too technical for, for, for the audience. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, was the next online. Thanks, Ben, for the nice talk. Uh, one question related to what uh, Tilman and Virginie said. Uh, seeing this comparison between uh, Prax CDI and uh, tachography, uh, doesn't that compromise uh, this as technique to, to, to determine the, the strain for, for one or for the other? Because you have uh, huge differences there. So unless it's, uh, it's determined which, in which conditions you get the same results, uh, it's difficult to know which one is correct regarding the determination of strain. Can you comment on that, please? Um, yes. Um... Well, I mean, I, I I always have the the struggles to when I see a paper. I always have the struggles to see when I see the result. The question in my mind is, can we trust this result? I always have this doubt, um, and that's kind of the reason I I want to to compare these two. Uh, but of course. Um, uh, Black tachography in this case is not guaranteed that gives you the, the correct result. So it's it's a bit difficult to draw a conclusion here from those results. Um, but the, the, the thing is, if do, doing simulations, um, on the other hand, it's always giving you the, the correct uh, um, uh, reconstructions. And um, it's quite different from the real uh, experiment because you have all sorts of issues. Um, I don't have a like a um, conclusive um, um, uh, how do I say um, conclusions here, but uh, but I hope uh, I'm trying to find out the answer here. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Matteo. Thanks. Was next. Yes, it's about uh, the source. You use a continuous source, and if I understand well, uh, I mean a constant intensity. Is it possible to use a pulsed uh, X-ray for this technique, or if you have experience about uh, this? Um, not not too much experience, but um, as long as um, uh, the the beam, each time you measure the uh, the diffraction pattern of the pulse, as long as the beam through different pulses, they are consistent. Uh, it's basically uh, similar to the can continuous case, I guess. But I guess in, in reality, the pulses are quite different from each other. So this would cause issue um, because Black Tackle relying on your probe being constant through different positions. Uh, there are, there are um, algorithms trying to deal with it uh, in transmission typography. Uh, I guess that can be tried, but to what level the 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 final quality would be, I, can, I cannot guarantee, basically. 
I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, Nick. Hi, Peng. Um, really cool to see the updated results from the comparison of the Bragg CDI and Bragg Tycho work at F13. Um, I was wondering if you'd compared, so for the crystal that you've got on the screen now, have you compared this with the APS data from the same crystal? Like, I guess, with That's the view it. of looking at a different probe? Um, yes, while I'm preparing this talk, I realized I should uh, should get that result and trying to yeah. compare. But I haven't done that. But uh, okay. yeah, that's definitely in my next. I mean, it, uh, it is the same crystal, right? I mean, it looks yes, very, very familiar yes. to me. <laughs> yes, it is the same. And I realize, yes, uh, at APS, you basically is a plane wave with Brax Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. You should be able to get that data, no worries. Yes, yes. I'll definitely do that. Cool. Um, um, I had a second question. When did you look at the, if you don't average the, like you did eight scans or something and then sum them? If you just, is there enough, is there, is the reconstruction high enough quality if you only reconstruct a single scan or not? Um, I haven't tried, um, but I, I would definitely try um, to get rid of this um, whether, mm. but, but then another question um, occurred to me is um, even during a rocking curve, your, your crystal can move slightly with respect to the beam. So, I mean, Certainly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you Absolutely. didn't really answer the question here, but I'll definitely try that, yes. Yeah, yeah. cool, thanks, Bang. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, before giving the word to other people who would like to ask, um, I have a question and a comment about this. It's obviously very intriguing, this comparison with results, so uh, uh, you were expecting to raise some noise here. Um, I think that in this case, uh, simulation would help a lot. So when when you you're using the um, the particle in a defocused beam, and obviously you don't know which part of the beam uh, the particle is is hitting. So this is this is one. I think this is, um, in my opinion, intuitively, this is the main factor here. It, the fact that over the three uh, over the three D uh, scan, you you are not sure that your particle is actually illuminated by the same part of the beam. And then another factor here, and but I can't uh, say how this is affecting, is that the crystal is actually a filter. Uh, so while with the tachography, you're actually using a, a parallel beam, with the CDI, you're using a divergent beam. So would you need a larger rocking curve to pick up all the component of the face? You see what I mean? Am I, am I being too uh, I, naive here? I'm not sure I understand the second question here. If you need to have a, a larger um, rocking curve yeah. with the CDI, just to try to pick up more of the divergence of the beam, or the divergence of the beam is smaller than the particle. No, it is larger. Yeah, so maybe I, maybe, maybe this is, is a bit too technical for this, but um, um yeah, we can discuss any... this offline. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry, we can discuss this offline. Yeah. I'm not sure I completely understand your question there. Are there any more questions or comments on, on this talk? I have one quite general. Oh, Virginie, I think you yeah, maybe I, I finished the question. Is what about energy scans for the 3D? This is an open question. Uh, I have not seen many results, um, even in, in, in with the Bragg CDI. Is there a fundamental issue, you think, for the, for the retrieval of um, energy scans? Um, well, I, I'm it, surprised to, uh, yeah, not to see a more result from, from energy scan Bragg CDI. Um, I don't know what caused that, but certainly the reconstruction is slightly more complicated. Uh, I don't know whether there is a, a existing uh, package that can do that and open sourced. I guess that may be one of the limiting factors. 
So mm -hmm. I remember a couple of years ago, um, uh, Alexander Bierling from Nanomax and Jasper Valentin, I think, from Lund University, they were trying to um, um, create an acquisition mode in which they moved for every energy, they moved slightly the detector away or closer to the beam mm -hmm. to adjust yeah. for the pixel size. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know if they ever uh, converge to any... Anyway. But I think in principle, you can do this um, computationally. You don't have to move detector to compensate for that. Yeah. OK. Yeah, if, yes, if I, if I may comment to, to this one, I think we have a paper with uh, Stefan Ruskevich where we introduce or where we use the back projection in order to compensate for the change of the pixel size during the scanning in energy. I, I I don't know why it is not used that much, but maybe it's because with the energy scan, you are moving along only along the QZ direction. And so you are not uh, maybe probing the reciprocal space in a very efficient way. Could be the, the reason. I, I don't know. I'm not very familiar with that. So I, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, actually, it was your question, Dina. Uh, about simulation, I, I think uh, Dina was was right when she mentioned that you can solve a lot of things by trying uh, by making different simulation uh, in order to understand the origin of this curvature, either in one of the other data set. Did did you try already to introduce? I don't know if you are if if your sample is slightly moving during your rocking curve or if you have a limited amount of photons or if you are if you do not know exactly where you are with respect to probe these kind of things the, are, are you planning to do or it's exactly um, I'm, I'm planning yes i'm planning because looking at this result uh, it seems like i cannot avoid simulation basically because yeah, yeah. without the result we cannot draw a conclusion from them so yeah i have to do yes i'm planning to do okay yeah, it's really nice Thanks. Oh yeah, next. Yeah, uh, related to the energy uh, scans, one of the issues you can have, even if the, the the energy scan is not very large, that the beam will move slightly depending on the offset of your mono. That means that if you move by one micron, two microns, and you are illuminating with another part of your beam, that then can cause a problem. And that might be one of the reasons this is not used so, so often. Yeah, in that case, you need a larger focus beam to basically avoid this kind of issue. Yeah, but even so, you will be illuminating a slightly different part on your monochromator and uh, changing things slightly. So, and it will shift vertically in, in a typical monochromator. If you don't change the offset, it will change by, by one micron. So yeah, maybe with a very wide beam, uh, you can get away with it. Yeah. I see. Uh, I would like to uh, bring to your attention that Marie Ingrid, who is in the audience. Hi, Marie Ingrid. Uh, she just put uh, on the common chat a link to a paper uh, to which she, she has co-authored, I believe, about the comparison. So this is something that is there for people interested. Yes, because that's uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm doing SCM. <laughs> I'm doing SCM at the same time. But yes, sir, in this paper, so at ID one, we are doing uh, energy scans while doing BCDI. So this is a. Uh, work we have done yes okay thank you for that so it's 1633 i officially close uh the the, the talk i would like everybody uh well i would like to like uh, to thank pank but we are all obviously everyone is welcome to stay longer and to contribute um what what Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> to contribute to the conversation and to this to the discussion. I thought I had closed the, 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 the chat. Um, no, Matteo, I, were you bye thinking bye. of some special no no don't stay there? I have uh, a question for you. Were you thinking of some special system for your pulsed um uh, experiment? Yeah, uh, yes, we had the not not me, but one of my colleagues has a financial support for a, a free electron laser. Uh, and he is yes, he's planning to build some uh, device for pulsed uh, uh, X-ray beam. Okay. And uh, here in Tor Vergata, he asked me some experiment related to two-dimensional materials and uh, uh, what we can do with two-dimensional material uh, connected to with the uh, pulsed um, X-ray beam. 
Okay. So the question was just about to understand if uh, pictography was uh, possible with that source. Yeah. yeah. Is it crystal samples or, or you do it in translation? In, in my case, it, they are films, very, very thin films, two-dimensional materials. Uh, yeah, but you want to do Bragg or transmission with them? In general, he is acquiring the, the source and then uh, he can use with every kind of material. It can be crystal, single crystals, thin films, what he wants. That we can just exploring which kind of materials are also biological uh, or different kinds which are suitable for that kind of analysis. Okay, so, which so kind you're... of analysis we can do with that yeah. uh, uh, facility? So this is a, a laboratory source. This means that it's a low yes. energy, yes. right? You know, there are a, a large amount of money because of the uh, financial support for the European community after, co after COVID. No? Okay. So um, every group has uh, planned to increase the, um, the facility of the laboratory. And one of the group here had that opportunity. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think I... I can uh, maybe send some put in yes, me, somebody who can, yeah. Yes, you, probably your suggestion will be very useful for me, yes. Okay. Uh. So, Peng, what, what I was saying before, it's, it's um, seeing that the, the beam is curved, you, you basically, with your crystal, you need to probe the whole beam to reconstruct it in CDI. Don't you need a larger angular scan for that? With respect to tachography? Am I being too, too naive here, too simplistic? You know, with, with, the, with the tachography, you are working in the focus beam. So you're, you're, you have a plane weight. There's no divergence there. There's no um, curvature. I... If you translate your curvature into the angular spread of your beam, which is in my opinion, what it is, you're basically having a, a number of incidents of incident beams in, in your, in your, right? So you, you mean need, you need a larger rocking scan to probe all. Um, I may be saying a very stupid thing, you know, uh, because it's I, very... I don't think that's true. Um, because um, often when you do a rocking curve, you tend to extend a little bit more, uh, so you really don't see too much photons towards the uh, either end of the rocking curves. Yeah, I think the effect of this convergence should be quite little. I would think. Mm -hmm. Unless anyone in the audience disagrees with that. Well, that's my my thought. I'm not sure that's correct, though. But the data that Nick was referring to, taking an APS, are they taking with a large beam, with a parallel beam, or with a focus beam? Uh, it's a larger focused beam with okay. KB thing. It's basically a typical setup uh, uh, ID thirty four C, I think. Because I think I think a comparison with those will will tell you a lot because I, I have some of... questions uh, yes. uh, again. So how sure you are that the sample is uh, the same between the APS experiments and even between the two uh, I thirteen experiments? How much sure you are that there is no? Did, did you try to do uh, Bragg CDI Tycho and back to Bragg CDI, for instance, to, to see the evolution of the sample? J just trying to understand where it could come from. So you mean the radiation damage, basically? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. or, or, from, or maybe the, also the reliability of the, of the, 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 the reconstructions in terms of data acquisition, noise, uh, everything. I mean, you know, if you have two data sets acquired in very similar uh, conditions, but they express the same kind of difference that you have. It's just the, the intrinsic limits of the, the experiment, maybe. I, I don't know, I'm just thinking uh, loud. I mean, if we talk about radiation damage, I, I guess um, the effect is quite little because it's gold, it's uh, 
uh, it, st uh, it stays in the bin quite well, I would think. And it's a third generation source. It's not it's not very uh, strong flux uh, on the crystal. So I would think. Um, but you, you didn't. Uh, no, you I didn't. didn't do, no. And and can we discuss again this uh, parabolic uh, uh, wavefront? The the one I was referring to with uh, with Arthur. Ah, I I didn't un understood your your answer. Yes, and um, the thing is, if you want a curve on your probe and the opposite curve on your on your object to cancel right. it out, right? The thing is, you need to move uh, your probe on an extended object like to different positions. Which you was can... the case of Arthur, right? Yes. Which was what Arthur was doing. Yeah, but you cannot have uh, those opposite curves on different positions on your sample to okay. cancel out, right? I see. I, 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 see, I guess uh, I see the, the, the point. Yeah, it's not consistent. So, so, so yeah. what you say is that you have only a no. I, I mean, I just listen, but I don't understand. So you have only a curvature when the probe is smaller than the object. But 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 I I don't understand why. Why why if the probe? No is no no. In, the object, I think no. I think in either case you you don't have this um, ambiguity in your Tarkovsky reconstruction. But uh, Arthur had. I mean, I, I saw it. Yes, I think I think now as if I think about it, I think um, what I remembered is um, it's the uh, and and I think it's also in a paper of uh, of, of John Rodenberg. I think he mentioned it. We found a, a reference to that problem. Yeah, yeah. I think the problem is not what you think. It's I I think it's the near field and far field uh, difference. Ah, c'est ça. Yeah, you're right. So near right. field, do you have an extra phase curve here? You need um, yes, yes, yes. You're right. You're right. You're right. It was it was the it was the near field far field limit. Yes, yes, right. And and you don't have anything like this uh, here. You you are uh, well. I think uh, well. Uh, our detect right. dis our detect distance is like three meters. So I would I think that's quite safe to to see. Yeah, but I mean, field. maybe it's uh, it's worth calculating. How large how large was the particle? Like a one micron. One micron roughly. is not large, yeah. Right. It's not too large. Okay. Peng, what happens if you add an artificial phase curvature to your probe during the reconstruction? Can you check if you get this kind of curvature out? So if you try to offset your, your reconstruction to check if you would be theoretically able to get this kind of artifact out of your beam. What do you mean? You mean with the real data? You with the real with the real data. You artificially add a phase curvature on the probe. Yes, and see if this and if if the if your algorithm is stabilizing without this curvature, if the curvature is getting transferred to your object. I, I think it's just a simulator, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess the, in the end it leads to the simulation. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, another question. So, sorry, may I? So of course, I just wanted to say goodbye to Peng, ah, but okay. bye it's bye. done. <laughs> bye bye, and bye, bye to the rest of course. Okay, Ciao. thank you, Tilma. That's what I was saying. Only to Peng. That's not nice. No. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Bye. bye. Um, Peng, uh, how did you estimate the the beam profile at the sample position in the Bragg CDI? Uh, could it be wrong here? Could could you have this little uh, additional curvature? Um, in this case, in in the in the experiment I've done, it's uh, basically the difference between Bragg CDI and Bragg Tycho. They they are sitting at the same position. That's why I have a default spin and small uh, crystal to to scan the beam. Okay. Okay. Uh, basically Sorry. sitting at the same plane. Yeah. Yes. So I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> no, no. But it's really cool, huh? Yeah, it yeah. is. That's ah, super. So, Peng, I hope you're happy to. You sparked quite a a conversation here. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. Well, so I hope you, you guys uh, well learn something or. or, <laughs> or oh, I think it's good. Yeah, we'll or take away some important uh, information from this talk. Yeah, that would be great. Yes. Yeah.
Hey, we're looking forward to the next one. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have to leave you. I have some data to look at. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. <No>. Yes, <laughs> great. Okay, thanks. Thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, see you in a couple of weeks again in this format. Yeah, thanks, oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao.